Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today was the third round of the FIDE Candidates Tournament in Toronto, Canada. So a lot of action happened today. All games were decisive. So let's have a look at what happened in round number three. So let's first have a look at some of the favorites in the tournament, the game between Ali Reza Ferruja and Fabiano Caruana. So Ali Reza was playing with the white pieces and he opened up with the move 1e4 as expected. I mean, he usually opens up with 1e4. He's aiming for sharp play. The move by Fabiano is perhaps already a little bit surprising. I would expect Fabiano to play solid with a move like e5, but Fabiano decides to go for the Sicilian. So c5, a knight of three by Ferruja by far the main move. And here's the move a knight to c6 by Fabiano. So with this move, he's inviting the open Sicilian, but white also has some other options. For example, the move Ferruja went for the move bishop to b5, the Rosolimo. And the idea is that very often you do want to trade off your bishop for the knight, and give black double pawns on the c pal. Furthermore, you can develop quickly with castles on the next move. All right, so knight of six, and this definitely already is a first surprise by Fabiano, attacking the pawn on e4. The main moves in this position are g6, e6, but also e5 has become more popular in recent years. So knight f6, hitting the pawn on e4, and Ferruja decides to play the move a knight to c3, defending it. Ferruja, by the way, also still playing quite quick, quickly, so it is clear that he has prepared this move as well. Another option white has here is something like e5, attacking the knight. The knight usually goes here. Moves like knight c3, offering a trade of the knights that way. But again, there's a lot of theory here. Don't want to get into too much depth. Knight c3 was the move chosen by Ferruja. Then knight d4 by Fabiano, going after the bishop pair. Another perhaps slight surprise. Queen c7 is also one of the main moves here. So knight d4 e5 attacking the knight on f6 and we can clearly tell by the time expenditure that Ferruja after move 94 was at least kind of out of book he took eight minutes for this move so Fabiano trades up the knight for the bishop Ferruja recaptures and now goes knight to d5 all right so c4 by Ferruja hitting the knight another very interesting option is the move a knight to g5 with the idea to put pressure here with moves like queen of three com coming quickly hitting the knight threatening this and in case black goes e6 to, the, to attack the knight, now there's knight e4. And you cannot stop a knight from jumping into d6 with a big attack for white. All right, so c4 was played, hitting the knight. The knight jumped back to c7. Ferruja moved the knight back, and now pawn to d5 by Fabiano. Perhaps an inaccuracy. It's logical that he wants to play in the center to bring out his bishop, but it seems like the right way to do so was to move d6 to also challenge this pawn on e5. And anyway, in both cases, white can take either after d6 or after d5. And that's what Ferruja did. He captured a pawn on croissant. I mean, hey, after all, it is forced. So he took the pawn. And here, I'm a little bit surprised that Fabiano did not take with the queen. Uh, because now the d pawn is a little bit backwards. He can go g6 afterwards, maybe bishop g4. But perhaps he was worried that Ferruja might get a quick initiative with moves like d4 coming. Anyway, pawn takes d6 was played. Uh, d4 by Ferruja, trying to open up the center, bishop b7, castles, castles, and bishop f4. So here, we see that black has the advantage of the bishop pair, but white has the advantage of having more space. White is the pawns on c4 and d4, and black is the pawns on c5 and d6. Now, you might be wondering, well, why is a space advantage an advantage? Well, you have more space, and that means that you can put your pieces on more active squares. For example, look at this bishop here, the knight here, and the knight here. And Ferruja's pieces, at least for the moment, are a little bit passive on the 7th and 8th ranks. Alright, so knight e6 by Fabiano, hitting the bishop and putting pressure on the pawn. The bishop moved back. And now knight e c7, an interesting move. So he wants to develop this bishop, perhaps the g4 or f5. And maybe at some point, he wants to break with the move d5 in the center. So Ferruja plays h3. Good move, stopping move, bishop g4 by Fabiano. Bishop to f5, therefore. Rook e1, rook e8. And queen and d2. Both sides slowly but surely bring their pieces into the game. And here Fabiano goes for a very nice move. He plays a move pawn to d5. Now very often what you want to do if you have the bishop pair is you want to open up the center. Because then the bishops get a lot of scope. Right? If these pawns are all out of the way, these bishops can become very dominant. Alright, so d5 was played. Nice move. Now the idea is that in case you take the pawn on c5, black takes the pawn on c4. And the material remains even. And if you take the pawn on d5, black plays the very strong move, pawn to c4. Temporarily sacrificing a pawn, but 
there's no good way to defend this double pawn on d5. So Ferugia plays bishop f4, Fabiano takes the pawn, Ferugia goes rook e5, hitting the, the bishop and the knight, but now Fabiano just takes on c3. Another nice move would have been perhaps something like bishop e6, just defending the knight, but he's, he decides to take on c3, and Ferugia recaptures. So now he's hitting the bishop and the pawn on c4, and Fabiano here decides to sacrifice a pawn. He could have solved both problems at the same time with the move bishop to d3, but here, you know, I can go for a move like rook a1, and the pin along the e-file is quite annoying to deal with. So queen of d7 was played defending the bishop, but again, it does sacrifice a pawn, and Ferugia took it. Rook a c8, bring the rook into the game. Queen b5, Fabiano trades, and goes bishop to e4, because this bishop was under attack, and a pawn as well. Now, Ferugia has an extra pawn here, but again, Fabiano has the bishop pair. This pawn on d4 is isolated, so White definitely has chance to win, but it is not at all easy to, uh, to convert or to create real winning chances. Because again, these bishops are very strong when the board is open, because they have all of those diagonals to operate with. Alright, so d5 was played by Ferugia, but now Fabiano goes a6. With the move d5, Ferugia is cutting off this diagonal, but now by going a6, White can take... But after takes, there's no more a hang pawn on a7. So that is what happened. Perugia goes rook d7, hitting the bishop. Bishop d6, hitting the rook. Rook a7, rook a8. The rooks get traded off. And once again, why does that extra pawn? But again, it's super difficult to ever do anything with it. This bishop over here is pretty nice. The other bishop can come out here. Or just stay on this diagonal. So very difficult for white to ever make any progress. So a3 was played h6 by Fabiano, just creating some move for the king. Rook to e1, rook to d8, activating the rook, bishop e5, rook d5, bishop to c3, bishop c5. And again, like it's very difficult to see what white is ever going to do because those black bishops are so strong. <clears throat> so he played knight e5, king h7, knight f3, bishop d7. And I feel like already the moves knight e5 and knight f3, to me, is an indication that Ferugia didn't know what to do. And he, he didn't mind a draw from now on anymore. Rook e5 was played, offering the trade of rooks. <clears throat> Fabiano decides to keep the rooks on the board with a check. Now you cannot go here, as that leads to a disaster after bishop to d6, and you lose an exchange. So Ferugia played rook d1, rook d5, rook e5, check. And so this game ends in a draw. So fine results for both players, I think, especially for Fabiano. He gets a difficult black game out of the way. For Ferugia... Obviously, it's not at all a disaster to draw the, the rating favorite in the tournament, but he does lose a white game, and he is still uh, in the bottom half of the field. All right, now let's move on to another game. So now we have a look at the game between Gukash and Nepo. So Gukash, like he did in round number one, opened up with the move d4. By the way, Gukash and Nepo are, well, are two of the leaders going into this round. Both of them are on one and a half out of two. So let's see how this round plays out. So pawn on d4 was played. Knight f6 by Nepomnishi. c4, e6, and now g3. So g3, one of the main moves, going for the Catalan opening. And so Jan decides to go for the move d5. Uh, Black said he behind the move knight f6 and e6 is to go into the Nimza Indian in case white plays the move knight of c3. Now you can go bishop b4 and pin the knight. But okay, Guga has shot other ideas. He plays the move g3, very clearly going for the Catalan d5, bishop to g2, and here quite a surprise by Nepomnishi. Nepomnishi in the World Championship match in 2021, and also in the World Championship in 2023, played the move bishop to e7, going for a very solid setup with castles after, and I'm a little bit surprised as to why he decided to switch it up. Alright, so he played the move c5, a move that is not as popular as some of the alternatives. Now Gukesh decided to take on d5, Nepo recaptured, and now knight to f3, developing the knight. And so what do we see here after a trade on d4, white castle to push to c5, white takes here? The structure is even. It's symmetrical, because both players do not have c and d pawns. But the big advantage white has here is the fact that white is this very active di diagonal for his bishop. Whereas the bishop on c8 is kind of passive. And it's not so easy to deal with all of those problems. And we'll see that come into play later on. So castles was played by Nepomnishi, knight to b3, hitting the bishop, forcing it away. The bishop moved to e7, and now Gukash plays the move e4, attacking the knight. 
and grabbing more space in the center. Knight to b4, knight c3. Here, perhaps a slight inaccuracy by an opponent. She, maybe he should have traded queens on d1 right away, forcing Gukesh to recapture with the f rook. Because in the game, he, he delays that trade. He goes knight a to c6, bridge b3. And now he trades. But now he gives Gukesh the possibility to recapture with the a rook, bringing that rook into the game. The problem is here, you don't want to take with the f rook anymore because black goes knight to c2, hitting the rook and the bishop. You're not losing material, but this trade is terrible because now you get doubled isolated pawns on the e-file and, and black is very comfortably be better. So rook 81 by Gukesh, 95 by Nepo, aiming for the c4 square, hitting the bishop and the pawn, and Gukesh plays a3, kicking the knight away, the knight has to step back, and now he goes f4, kicking the other knight away and gaining more space in the center. So knight c4 was played, hitting the bishop and the knight, Bishop to c1, solving both problems at the same time. And now Nepo goes f6, an understandable move. He wants to stop the move e5 by Gukesh, opening up the long diagonal for his light square bishop. So f6, but now Gukesh comes up with another very nice plan. He plays the move rook fe1. And his idea is to go bishop to f1, kick the knight away, and once the knight moves, then his other bishop can come out to play again. So Nepo played rook to b8, bishop f1, and knight d6. But now Gukesh just continues with his plan. He plays, or actually he don't, he goes knight b5, offering the trade of knights. And the idea behind this trade is that after takes takes, it is difficult to bring this bishop into the game. You cannot go bishop d7. You can also not go b6, as that will hang the knight on c6. The idea behind the move b6 is to go here, but obviously it doesn't work. So Nepo played king f7, bishop e3 by Gukesh, bring the bishop into the game, and putting pressure on the pawn on a7. And here, Nepo is in some danger. Again, the, the structure is pretty symmetrical, but white is more space in the center. And on the king side, also has nice pressure here. And black is struggling to develop. So Nepo played the move a6, kicking the bishop away. The bishop moved all the way back to e2. And now he goes b5, gaining a little bit more space on the queen side. And enabling himself to develop that light square bishop to the b7 square. All right, so knight c5 by Gukesh, making it difficult for that bishop to develop. Now in case you go here, there's a fork on the d7 square, so you cannot do that. So rook to d8 was played by Nepo. Gukesh trades, black recaptures, and he goes rook to c1, x-raying the loose knight on c6. Nepo goes bishop to b6, making sure that this knight cannot move for the moment, as that will hang the bishop on e3. King f2 by Gukesh. We see a trade, white recaptures, and bishop to b7. But at this point, it's clear that things are looking really good for Gukesh. He's got a very nice bishop pair, more space, some of the black pawns are loose. And so it feels like Nepo is under real pressure here. And Gukesh just slowly but surely improves his position. He goes king e3, bring the king closer to, to the center, making sure that this pawn is always protected. Rook to d8. And perhaps here, what he should have done is go for the move a4, trying to loosen up the black pawns on the queen side. And the idea is that in case you take, now you have ideas of, let's say, rook c4, taking here, and then also the pawn on a6 is weak. And you also sometimes have ideas of bishop to c4 followed by f5. Actually, here not because of knight a5, but it is an idea to keep in mind. Anyway, he played bishop to b6, hitting the rook, the rook stepped up. And actually, right here is where he should have gone for that idea. He had to move a4, sacrificing the pawn. And again, with the idea that in case black takes, now you can go bishop c4, as now there's no knight a5 to kick the bishop away. And a5 here will come with more effect, because not only will it win a pawn in case white takes, white will also have a fork on the king and the rook. But Gukesh plays the move rook d1, and I think this is a little bit too timid. Now the rooks can come off, and it feels like... Black is definitely still under pressure, but the position might become more manageable now. With the rooks of the board, there is not as much pressure anymore. So this rook is kind of passive, and this rook was kind of active. So we see a trade. g6 by Nepomnishi. Bishop to c5. h5, gaining some space on the queen side, on the king side, sorry. b3. And now Nepo goes for a very nice move. He goes for the move bishop to c8. He wants to go e5. Gaining space in the center, and now this bishop can come out here. And I think, you know, Gukesh had a nice advantage, but I think the real reason why he um, 
let it slip perhaps a little bit, is the clock. Nepo still had a very comfortable 44 minutes on the clock, whereas Gukesh had six minutes. And also you have to keep in mind that there's no increment. So it's very difficult to find those super precise moves to really tighten the screws on your opponent. So bishop to c8. Now he goes a4, a4, trying to loosen up that pawn. e5 by Napalmashi. We see a trade. And now the move f5. So his idea is to take and try to loosen up that pawn on h5. And also, you don't quite want to take. I mean, you can, but the problem is that white is going to take here. And first of all, white will now get an outside passer. And you can always use that outside passer to deflect the black king while you are going pawn hunting in the center and on the queen side. Furthermore, if these pawns clean up, then the white king will get a very clean path of entry. So, Nepo keeps the structure. He plays the move king to g7. We see a trade, and now bishop g4. Excellent move. Bring the bishop into the game. This trade is completely fine for black, because now this, this pawn on g4 completely neutralizes white's majority on the king side. And actually, black has a very good chance to win here, as black can take here and create a pass pawn himself on the king side. Whereas, again, white cannot do that on the king side, because if you go h4, black is going to take it. All right, so bishop to c2 by Gukesh, keeping the bishops on the board. But now Nepo goes bishop to e6, king d2, b4, another very precise move by Nepo. If you take the pawn right away, then there's king c3, and the pawn on b5 can become a little bit vulnerable, with bishop e3 coming next. But with b4, now there's no more a clear way of entering the position. This bishop is clamping, is uh, keeping this bishop passive, defending the b3 pawn. The king cannot come and invite us the d3 and the c4 square. So it feels like right now we're just headed towards a draw. So Gukash played bishop d1. Nepo took the pawn. And a draw was agreed. So very nice defensive effort by, uh, by Jan. He manages to hold this game with the black pieces. Super important for his chances. Gukash, however, misses some chances. But it's really impressive how the 17-year-old is doing in this tournament. And he's still tied for the lead. All right, now let's have a look at two players that are in the bottom half. We have the players Nijad Abbasov, the lowest seed in the field. So it's not completely unexpected that he is in the bottom half. But I don't think a lot of people would have expected Hikaru to be on the, in the bottom half as well. Anyway, let's have a look. Nijad has been playing very solid chess in this tournament. So let's see what he's going to do in this game. In this game, he opens up with the move d4. And here, a bit of a surprise by Hikaru. Hikaru often has played the King's Indian in games that he would really want to win, or sometimes the Nimzo Indian. Uh, because he is outrating his opponent by 150 points. And, you know, in a candidate, a tournament that you have to win, you would expect him maybe to take some chances and try to beat Nijad, even though he does have the black pieces. All right, but Ikaru plays the move d5 with cc4, the Queen's Gambit, and Ikaru plays the move c6, the start of the Slav defense. All right, the Slav, very solid opening, very easy, to, very easy to learn. It's an opening I've taught to a lot of my students. I also have a video on it. Feel free to check it out. One of the drawbacks of the Slav at a higher level, and especially if you do want to win with the black pieces, is that white does have this move, pawn takes d5. Going for the exchange Slav, keeping the structure very symmetrical. E card recaptured, knight c3, knight f6, knight f3. The advantage of the trade, though, is that now your knight can come out to this active c6 square. Bishop f4, and here to move a6 by Hikaru. The idea behind move a6 is that you want to develop this bishop, either to g4 or f5. And that's what Hikaru does here. And now, in case white goes queen b3, which is often an annoying move to deal with, you now have the more comfortable knight a5, hitting the queen, defending the pawn. And the difference is that now, in case white gives a check, you have to move b5 because you already have that pawn on a6. So that is the idea. Now, Nijat keeps it very solid. He goes for the move h3. Hikaru decides to trade. It's a little bit risky to keep this bishop on the board a little bit longer, as then white has the deals of g4, hitting the bishop. The bishop moves back. And then like knight e5, combined with a quick h4, h5. So the right move is to trade. But this does give white the bishop pair. Now, the thing is, white does have the bishop pair, but the position is fairly closed, and Black can quickly try to trade off one pair of bishops, and that's what Ikaru does here. He goes e6, rook to c1, and then bishop to d6, trying to get those dark squared, of, dark squared bishops off the board very quickly. Nijat goes bishop to d3, 
we see a trade and now castles by Ikaru. So castles, rook to c8, contesting the half open c file. Nijot perhaps is a tiny bit better here after maybe like a3, knight a4, knight c5, maybe double, double up the rooks. But it's very difficult for either side to make anything happen. Queen f3, queen d6 now by Ikaru, queen e2. We see knight e7, queen e2, knight e7, knight e2, g6. We see a trade, rook c1, there goes another pair of rooks. Honestly, this game, there's no other way to put it than saying that this game is boring. We see bishop d3, knight b4, bishop back, knight c6, and eventually this game ended in a repetition of moves and a draw. So, I mean, not a terrible result for Ikaru, however, he does stay in the bottom half of the field. He's only a point behind, though, and the tournament is still very, very long, still 11 more rounds to go. A normal tournament would not have even started yet at this point. However, you know, given the fact that he is playing the lowest seed in the field, you know, he might have felt that, you know, maybe I should have taken a little bit more risk, but anyway, we'll see how this will play out in the next couple of rounds. Also, Nijot apparently said in an interview that he wasn't feeling too well, so maybe, you know, if Hikar had known that, then he, uh, like I said, maybe he would have taken a little bit more risk. Anyway, let's have a look at, uh, at the next game. But also, one thing I did want to point out, if you're playing a very well-prepared pre player, player rated 2630, it is difficult to beat them with the black pieces in case they play super solid. Anyway, let's move on to the next game. The next game was the game between Vidit Gujarati and Pragnananda. This one, definitely the game of the round. So let's have a look. Vidit opens up with the move 24. Also, by the way, going into this round, Vidit was one of the leaders with one and a half out of two, and Pragnananda was in the bottom half with half a point out of two games. So e4 was played, e5 by Prag. Also, by the way, note that Vidit spent like a minute on the first move, but again, he just wants to get into the zone, take a little bit of time, and fully emerge himself into the playing arena. So now, knight of three. Knight c6 and bishop to b5, the start of the reload pass. Now, many moves have been played here. Knight of 6 the solid Berlin defense. You can go into the martial, other systems like the archangel. Prague goes a6. All of this is normal. Bishop a4. But here he shocks the entire world of chess. With the move pawn to f5, the delayed Schliemann gambit. Now... <clears throat> The move f5 is uh, definitely also a move here. It's called the Schliemann or the Janisch Gambit. But here, it's a little bit less common. Now, there are some advantages to having move, moves a6 and bishop a4 included. But the drawback is that now white has the move d4. If you play the move d4 against the direct Janisch Gambit, it's not as good. Because here, black can take on e4, attack your knight. You can take the pawn on e5, but black will take. You recapture. And now there's the move pawn to c6, hitting the bishop. And in case you move the bishop, then there's queen a5 check, and black wins the pawn on e5. So that's no good. You know, the move d4 is a move you might know from the Vienna Gambit, which, you know, let me quick opening lesson here in case white goes knight c3, knight of 6 f4. Here, d5 is the move. But as I showed that bishop on b5 is actually to your disadvantage because of that move c6, followed by queen a5. All right, so pay attention. But now, since black has played a6 and a5, here the move d4 is best again. So d4, striking in the center. So Prague takes the pawn, and here the move e5. White sacrifices a pawn, but the idea is that now it's very difficult for black to develop that knight to f6. So Prague goes b5, bishop b3, and knight a5, putting pressure on that bishop over here. Knight takes d4, regaining, regaining the pawn, and now bishop to b7. And again, look at the time expenditure. Vidit here spending 18 minutes on the move 9 takes d4, making it very clear that he is out of book. Prag plays bishop to b7, attacking this pawn over here. And here the critical move is the castle, defending that pawn over here, getting the king out of the center. You might be wondering, well, why would Vidit not do that, right? I mean, you know, I see that this pawn is hanging. I mean, I want a castle. Well, the thing is, after move castles, you do have to reckon with the move c5, hitting the knight, and if you take the pawn over here, there is the move c4, trapping the bishop on b3. So you have to be ready to sacrifice a piece. And keep in mind that Pragnananda is well prepared 
Vita does not. So do you want to sacrifice a piece against a, you know, practically a computer? I mean, it might be the best continuation, but if you don't know the ins and outs, it's very understandable that Vita did not feel comfortable going for this. So it goes for the move knight takes a 5, but it turns out that this might be a slight mistake. Crack takes the bishop and now plays the move pawn to d6, trying to regain this pawn over here. Queen e2 by Vidi, defending the pawn and x-raying the king on e8. And now the move queen d7 by Prague attacking the knight on f5. He's sacrificing not a pawn, but in case you take with check, by the way, black just goes king f7. And the knight's on our attack, black wants to go rook to e8. This is hanging. You have knight e3, which solves a lot of the problems at the same time. Close the e-file, defends this. But it turns out that after takes, black gets pretty good compensation. Black is going to go rook e8, knight f6, rook f8. And all of the black pieces are super active. And this black king can always step back to the g8 square. So very nice opening play here by Prak. And that's why Vidit didn't want any of this. He played the move pawn to e6. Hitting the queen. The queen with the c6 attacking the pawn over here. And here Vidit played bishop to g5. A very interesting move. He's stopping Prak, at least for the moment, for going queen side castle. As now that bishop is controlling the square. And in this position, Pragnananda played the move pawn to h6, trying to push that bishop away. And Vita gave a check on the black king. The king cannot move anywhere. And Prag was like, oh, shoot. Oh, shoot. He completely missed that move. So he played g6, and Vita was like, I'm sorry, bro. He took, and that was checkmate. So Vita won a very nice game with the white pieces in round number three and takes the lead in the candidates tournament. I hope all of you guys enjoyed watching, and I look forward to seeing all of you in the next video. Just kidding, that's not what happened. Of course, Prague did not play the move h6, that's terrible. He played the move g6, kicking the knight away. The knight moved back to e3 to defend the pawn on g2, and now he goes h6, pushing the bishop away. Now, as I was following this game, which before was played in 97, I became more and more concerned about Vidit's chances. Not only is Pragnananda already better, also Vidit is seriously down on the clock. He's got 38 minutes, and keep in mind that for the first 40 moves, there is no increment, so you have to do it with the time you have. And, you know, if you run out of time, you literally lose the game. So he played the move c4, and now b4, another very nice move by Prague. He's stopping this knight from developing to the c3 square. And he's keeping the queen side closed, which is where he wants the castle. Queen g4, queen c5, nice move. We see castles, and now bishop to g7, developing the bishop and attacking the pawn on b2. So we see knight to d2. And here, perhaps a mistake by Pragnananda. I like the idea of queen side castling and then trying to attack this king over here. But maybe objectively, it would have been better to go kingside castling. But I understand, black's kingside is a little bit soft with the pawns in g6 and h6. So I understand that he, that he didn't want to go for this. Instead, he goes for queenside castles. But now, Vidit, uh, what he should have done is go for the move knight to d5. Hitting this knight over here. He is giving back the pawn, but in case you take, there you can take back right away. Or maybe throw in a check. And it turns out that white is doing quite all right in the um, in the complications. Now, Vidit plays the move h4. This is a this is definitely way too slow. He's stopping the move g5 by Prague. It's understandable because Prague has some ideas to go g5, hit this bishop, and if the bishop moves back, then h5, hitting the queen, followed by h4. But again, g5 might not even be a real threat because in case you take this is hanging, and again there were tactics with knight d5. So h4 definitely way too slow, and also this is weakening the white king a little bit. Prague goes rook d8, activating his rook. Rook d1, and now takes the pawn on b2, restoring the material balance. So Vita goes knight to d5, giving up yet another pawn, but Prague just takes it, takes the pawn on d5. And it's not clear at all what white has for the pawn here. I mean, black's got a very nice pair of bishops. The pawn on e6 is weak. White's king a little bit weakened now that this move h4 has been played. So Vita gives a check over here with e7, checking the king. Prague just slides his king over to b8. Bishop b3 attacking the queen. The queen moves over here, defending the pawn on c4. And now knight is c4, attacking the bishop. But Prague just very calmly plays the move bishop to c3, nicely anchoring in his bishop over here. Bishop d4, nice move by Vidi, hitting the rook and the bishop. 
Prag again super calmly just plays the move. Oh, he went there. A rook h7 also would have been a good move, hitting this pawn over here. But he goes rook to g8, and I think with this move, he wants to go g5 later on to try to open up that g file to hit the pawn on g2. All right, so we see a trade. Queen d4, big mistake by Vidi. But again, he is getting low on time, only 9 minutes on the clock, and he needs to make another 12 moves, so less than a minute per move. He should have played knight a3 first, hitting the queen. And in case the queen moves, then rook e1 to defend this. But all of this is not easy to figure out during the game. Instead, he plays the move queen e4, hitting the bishop and the pawn. The Prague just very calmly moves the bishop back to b7. And also notice how quickly Prague is playing now. He's also not only playing the position, he's also trying to put Vidit under pressure on the clock. Because again, Vidit has only 5 minutes left and needs to make another 11 moves. So he takes the pawn, Prague takes the pawn. Knight a5, and Prague goes rook to e5, hitting the knight. Now, I think here, Vidit arguably made this wait, mate, uh, maybe the decisive mistake of the game. He should have traded off his knight for the bishop, because then, in case black recaptures, you always have ideas of rook b4, trying to swing the rook over here, maybe rook here. But his move actually, the move that he plays here, actually takes away a lot of his counterplay. He, move, he plays the move b4. But now, like I said, that b4 square is never again available for a rook or a queen. So this only makes the black king safer. And Prague here goes for his own counterplay with the move g5. Trying to open up that g file for the rook to hit the pawn on g2. If it is like, no, I don't want that h file to, to I don't want that g file to open up. He goes h5. And Prague's like, I do want that g file to open up. And he goes for the move g4. He wants to go g3. Also hit the pawn over here. And it's super difficult to see how Vidit can hold all of this together. And again, he was in serious time pressure. So he plays rook fe1, g3, nice move by Prague, creating some tension between the pawns, and the white king is going to get open up here. Vidit trades off that super strong bishop on b7, but now Prague takes for the check, takes on b7, hitting the pawn over here, and Vidit with barely any time left goes queen f3, offering the trade of queens, defending this pawn, but again, Prek super calmly plays the move rook to g5, hitting the pawn. Vidit trades, Prek recaptures, Vidit goes g4, Prek takes, and Vidit finally reaches the time control with rook d6. But he reaches the time control, but with a completely losing position. He is down two pawns, and yeah, in an endgame, there's just no chance of saving this. Rook h4, hitting the pawn. He took the pawn on h6, rook to g5, this h-pawn is going to disappear. He moves the rook to h7, rook takes, rook d7, king c8. Now the only chance white still has here is the fact that there's two rooks on the board. Now if you can create an, create an attack with the two rooks, it might not be easy for black to convert. But if Prague is able to trade one pair of rooks, then the game should be completely over. So rook e7 was played. Rook to e5, offering the trade of rooks. Rook g7, and now Prague is a check. And Vidit resigned. The reason why Vidit resigned is that after he moves the king, now Prague can just go rook g5. Trade of the rooks. There's no more worries for black. You can go here. And again, with a th three versus uh, one majority, black is easily winning here. So very nice game for Prague. He comes back into the settings. He moves back to 50%. Vidit, he had a great game yesterday, crushing he with the black pieces. But today he loses and he's back to 50% as well. So with all of that, let's have a very quick look at the standings. We have the following standings right here. Okay, I see it's a little bit off, but Fabiano is in the lead with Gukash and Nepo with two points. Then we have Vidit and Prague with one and a half. And then we have some players with one point. Nijat, Ali Reza and Hikaru. So we'll see how they're going to do in the next games to come. Hikaru indeed is not too far behind. Again, it's a very long tournament, so still all to play for. And let's also very quickly have a look at the pairings tomorrow. So tomorrow, we see that Hikaru is playing with a white piece against Prague. Prague is proving himself to be super well prepared for this event. Not going to be easy. Jan Pomyashi is playing with the white piece against Vidit. Vidit has proven himself to be uh, very strong mentally. He can definitely come back, but Nepo, 
you know, he's very dangerous with the white piece. So we'll see how that game turns out. We have Fabiana Caruana against Gukesh. Fabiana, one of the leaders. Gukesh as well. So that one will be exciting. And this one is going to be fire. The game between Nijat Abasov and Hikaru today was pretty boring. But I don't expect Veruja to do the same thing. Veruja, he is going to bring fire. He is going to do something. He's going to imbalance the game. And he's going to take his chance, especially because Abasov admitted that he's not feeling well today. So I'm very curious to see what Ferruja is going to do. One thing you have to keep in mind, though, is that maybe what Abasov is doing, maybe he's playing some games. You know, maybe he's thinking, hey, I'm going to play super solid. I'm going to let these people come at me, take a lot of risk. And when they take a lot of risk, that's when I'm going to strike. So I'm super curious how tomorrow is going to play out. At any rate, I do hope that all of you guys enjoyed this recap and I look forward to seeing all of you in the next video.